Acá desde Miami, eh, mi nombre es Diego Costa Peuser, yo soy director de la feria. Eh, les quiero agradecer a todos que los que nos acompañan y quiero agradecer muy especialmente a nuestro sponsor principal, el IFG, y a todos los sponsors que hacen posible que la feria se realice. Eh, en este caso, en nombre de Pinta Miami, eh, bueno, como todos saben, debido a la pandemia de este año, ha sido, no ha sido posible realizar la feria 100% en su parte física, pero hemos tenido una feria híbrida donde tenemos una feria virtual que los invito a todos hasta el 15 de diciembre a recorrerla, a visitar a, a cada una de las galerías que están divididas en sus cinco secciones, eh, con muchos filtros, con una navegación muy fácil para recorrer. y Hemos realizado durante la semana pasada hasta el día de ayer algunos eventos pop-up para los que están acá en Miami, los que están, los que pudieron salir de otros países y, han visit y están visitando Estados Unidos y después a toda la gente, a toda nuestra audiencia de Miami. Eh, en este caso eh, vamos a tener hoy una visita guiada especial que nos acompaña Jenny Fernacio. Ella es máster en teoría de arte contemporáneo de Goldsmith por la Universidad de Londres y es curadora asociada del Pérez Art Museum de Miami. Ella en el PAM ha curado la obra de numerosas artistas y participa en el desarrollo y conceptualización de los programas públicos del museo. Así que Jennifer, te quiero agradecer que nos estés acompañando. Muchísimas gracias y te voy a dar la palabra. Eh, quiero eh, eh, la audiencia creo que sepa que abajo a la derecha está eh, la traducción Jennifer va a dar toda la visita guiada en inglés y lo pueden escuchar en inglés o en español en el canal que ustedes se sientan más cómodos muchísimas gracias muchas gracias Jennifer hello um, thank you so much Diego thank you everyone that is attending this tour here tonight um, So let me just start sharing the screen. So it's always very interesting, um, you know, visiting um, art fairs because um, as a curator, we're often looking at, um, you know, new, new things, new artists. Um, yet it's also a moment to, to find, um, to see like, you know, uh, important traditional um, older work, classical works and, and artists that have um, been making art history, right? Um, just give me one second here because I have so many, <laughs> my screen is so tiny. Um, and I was very excited to see um, this grouping of works from Latin American masters by Francisco Toledo, who is a, Uh, was a Mexican Zapotec painter. He recently died last year in September. And he had a very prolific career. As you can see here, we have multiple works that are, um, you know, drawings, paintings, sculptures. And he, um, you know, had a, a, a career that spanned, uh, spanned for seven decades. So you see a lot of, of variety within this artistic practice. And, um, Not only was his work uh, very prolific, he was also very involved um, within his community. Um, he was a Zapotec uh, 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 Mexican um, and was very active within his community of, of Oaxaca. He participated in, in um, you know, uh, building community uh, institutions and places for For the people, and you see this, um, this I think passion for for the human within the work, right? Um, he is celebrated by uh, being this symbol that expresses his, uh, you know, deepest myth or or the deepest myths of Mexico um, within his work. One example I want to see here is. Um, Let's see, it has this very mythical and surreal quality. And that's something I wanted to point to with this work. Um, to Let me just open it here real quick. 
how, you know, these influences from Irb, how him as a Mexican artist is bringing this back into his own country and applying this to his surroundings. This is, if you're familiar with Cezanne's The Dancer's Painter, it's a direct, you know, um, influence and reflection on that. Just looking at the, you know, the details of, of this uh, print here. It's just amazing. So wanted to start off with Francisco Toledo, uh, mainly because of that, you know, these um, very iconic works um, that are part of, of this amazing uh, fair here. Then um, let me just close this off here so I don't get lost. Um, the next uh, gallery I wanted to browse through is uh, Latin Art Core. Um, a local Miami artist, uh, I mean, Miami gallery that represents, you know, very iconic figure within Latin American art. When you think about Latin American art and when you go to Pinta, you know, it's very hard to walk through the fair without um, encountering these works by, by these iconic artists. And uh, as a transition from Fra Francisco Toledo, uh, I wanted to just highlight this um, uh, really amazing oil on burlap by Wifredo Lam, uh, an iconic Cuban artist that, you know, uh, sought to portray and revive this Afro-Cuban spirit within the culture. So the same way that Francisco Toledo was looking at this pre-Columbian history uh, within his uh, country, Wifredo Lam is doing that as well, um, you know, looking at this Afro uh, reference within, within the Cuban uh, culture. So just going back here real quick. And of course there are other various examples here um, throughout this gallery. And before we go into some other works here, um, I wanted to stop by Manuel Mandive who creates these beautiful, also like surreal, you know, we see a lot of these European influence within these works such as we fit in lumps, cubism, um, cubism approach with these primitive figures. And here we also see these uh, surreal, right? Um, very surreal and expressionistic qualities within these paintings by Mandivi. And Mandivi was also, uh, he was an Afro-Cuban painter, um, sculptor, performance artist. So, I mean, he is um, uh, uh, an artist that that is, you know, perceiving art through many mediums, um, and you know, these paintings are very evocative of of these carvings, right, or um, cave carvings, or or um, paintings that you see like almost prehistoric. So it has this very, um, uh, you know, eerie quality to it, but also. Um, very, uh, you know, very, very contemporary as well. Um, the movement that you see within these paintings, right, also reflect the performance and, and, and body art as well. And I wanted to go back to the other uh, work that we have here. It's beautiful oil on canvas from, 80, from 1987. So it's a little bit of a, you know, an older work that has, you know, incredible figures that are, you know, just coming from his imagination, but also are references to, you know, religious, um, religious influences within Cuba. We have Walter Mass, this, this figure that was so iconic within art history, right? The, the, the figure of, of fertility that, that we are often um, referenced or, or talked about and and taught in our history courses. We see a lot of these overlapping um, influences within Mandiva's work. And it's, you know, it's, it's great to see artists that are um, bringing a contemporary insight into um, the history of slavery, right? And African mythologies within the Caribbean islands, such as Mandiva. So this is also was an incredible work that I, I loved um, encountering here on the website. And while we're, you know, looking at Cuban artists, I just wanted to stop by um, Amelia Pelais again also, you know, uh, um, 
wanted to focus a little bit on some female figures, female artists from, from Cuba um, and, and that are represented in this gallery. And Amelia Belais, you know, is, um, just want to go here and want you to see the, the details of, of this work at, you know, at a, a distance, one might think that this, you know, has a reference to stained glass, which she um, often does within her work, but um, also this very, again, uh, was an artist that was exposed to cubism and surrealism. And you see these um, you know, being reinterpreted into a new technique and, and a new form that she's creating here. She was um, often uh, influenced by the domestic, right, by the domestic space, um, looking at um, her surroundings. And it's, you know, very, um, uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, if you see a, a woman artist painting this, um, uh, the domestic space, it, you know, almost counterintuitive, but the way she approaches this by adding these uh, influences from, from European art, uh, it's just, you know, um, she's doing something very new. And she was part of this, the first, uh, Vanguard in Cuba, uh, the first wave of Cuban artists that you know traveled to Europe and came back with all of these influences um, into their work. Let me just go back here. And again, to focus on another female artist within this gallery, Lolo Saldivia. Um, let me just click here. Um, another uh, really iconic artist that, you know, started getting a lot of recognition lately. Um, this is a fairly small work, but she has, you know, she tends to, uh, she tended to work on smaller, a smaller scale, but there are some larger um, paintings and, um, you know, mixed media um, as well. I'm sorry, my dog is here, <laughs> he's distracting me. Um, and, you know, she was a main player in Cuba's geometric revolution. So I wanted to talk to her about her here just as a transition into the other works that I wanted to, to show in this gallery. Um, but, you know, as many artists from her generation, again, like Pelaez, uh, uh, Wifred Alam and many others going to Europe and bringing back these influences into their, into their work. But, you know, she experimented with with diverse mediums, and she, um, uh, you know, was part of this uh, concrete art movement, um, and and was a member of the Concrete Ten, which was a group of experimental artists in Havana that uh, wanted to revolutionize, you know, Cuban art at, at during their time. So she was uh, highly recognized for, you know, this this very unique approach to, to these geometric forms. Um, and, you know, although she had a really small body of work, it was uh, very uh, significant. Then looking at um, other works here within this gallery that, you know, has a really great representation of, of Latin American artists. Um, of course, Hulula Park is, um, we had a, a show at, the, at, at, at Pam that I worked on. So I'm always happy to, very excited to see his work at many of, of you know, galleries around the world. I'm always bumping into his work and it's always, you know, it always amazes me how, um, you know, may, maybe I'm, uh, it's a bit subjective because I had this, um, you know, working with the artist and had a closer experience. But um, this, uh, My Long March, is um, a very iconic work by Hulala Park where he, you know, Hulala Park is known for, uh, he's an Argentinian artist and he's known for pioneering, you know, kinetic art within um, Argentina. And um, you see these shapes, these forms moving, um, your eyes, you know, are following it. And, and, and the way when this particular work is displayed um, at times as a, 
you know, a long linear uh, row um, and uh, they start connecting. It's just, it really brings you into the painting. And, you know, this is, um, it's an op art movement, but it really tells what is to come later on in his career where he is, you know, starts playing with these um, geometric forms, very small scale, because this was at the time when he left Argentina, went to um, to Paris to study in a really small studio. So um, he talks a lot about how he, you know, was forced to work really small with geometric um, forms and, and that created kinetic art. But later on, I mean, that created op, his op art. Uh, pieces. But later on, I think he was, you know, always so eager to bring movement into the work. That's where he started really experimenting with kinetic art, which we don't see here. But I, I love to see, you know, the 2D works and, and, and see like, you know, his career slowly building into kinetic art. Um, there's another example here as well. That I saw earlier. Yeah this modulation um a much later work you know it's not from from the the 60s the 70s but still very you know this the sense of movement very present within within this 2d work and just you know to give a little bit of a of a more information on his kinetic art he um, was part of the grave uh movement which was a it was uh, the research group for visual art. It consisted of, um, if I'm not mistaken, six artists, um, no, 11, 11 artists uh, that, you know, such as Francois Morellet, um, Victor Vassarelli, which there's also another work within this gallery by, by the artist. Um, and they wanted to, they created a manifesto that they wanted to move away from, you know, 2D work on the wall and wanted to bring the public into the art and, and, and engage the participation. So, um, you know, from an earlier point, as you can see here, you see his interest in, in this need for movement, this need for, you know, moving out of the wall of the 2D plane and, 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 uh, uh, you know, and engaging with the viewers as opposed to, you know, what he would describe as this elite art that was just, you know, on the wall. He wanted to make it very public and very engaging um, with a lot of movement. So Victor Vassarelli, which I just mentioned, this is another example here, another artist, another member of the Grave group from the 60s. And you know, Jesus, I just wanted to quickly point out Jesus Rafael Soto, who has not um, had a lot of, of conversations and connections with the Grave group. He was al also went to Paris to study, but was not you know, an official member of the group. Um, but this is, you know, almost like a, a small scale uh, model of what a larger piece would look like, where do you have these um, geometric forms, you know, um, held by strings that move as the viewers are moving around it. So um, it, it's also, you know, like I said, amazing to see these um, older works. This is from 1967. And then conversation with other works that were highly influenced or were, you know, at the same time talking to one another, such as, as Le Parc and Victor Vassarelli. And let me just close this. Let me close this as well. Oops. I left it all prepared in case we couldn't open it. Um, the next uh, gallery I wanted to explore is, let me move up here real quick. Uh, Lorix Arte Contemporânea from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, this is a gallery, you know, I'm always in, interested in seeing when, when I go to Brazil in person, you know, uh, to see in person or also uh, at art fairs um, whenever um, they are participating because they have such a variety of, of 
you know, older generational artists from younger artists working and, and, and the influences, how they, they connect. Um, I, of course, cannot, you know, talk about uh, geometric art, neo-concrete art, concrete art without talking about uh, Aile Chisika. He is my, <laughs> my favorite. And um, no matter where I am, I always love um, seeing, you know, his, his, his work. And the same as Hulula Park, where um, I showed, um, you know, this 2D work and um, which they're both known for this, this wall work, work on paper, um, or cardboard in this case, uh, with these very tiny geometric forms. Again, you see this need for movement, right? By, by rotating, working on this grid, but intervening on the grid and, and creating these, um, these tilted um, shapes in order to, to activate the piece. Um, you see that in Hula Park, you see that in Soto, uh, Cruzias, and, um, but it's, it's amazing to see, you know, how, how these artists start, right? This was from 1958. And um, oh, I wanted to share a, uh, a picture here. Let me just do Elio Oichisika real quick, because I love seeing the metaschemas with this in, in you know, uh, in comparison. So Elio Chisica starts with those 2D works, um, uh, you know, looking for that movement within um, this, this 2D work and then slowly starts moving away from that where you see this experimental. So um, it's always important, you know, um, I, I do love his participatory art, but the earlier works are, are key, you know, to uh, it's all part of it, right? It's it's the beginning steps in order to uh, take him to that. So um, again, this is uh, always great to see within these art fairs, you know, the history, um, the background, uh, it informs, you know, where the artist was coming from. And um, Abraham Palachnik, who is also um, another Brazilian artist, and this is the Progressão. Um, it's a work, Abraham Palachnik is, you know, has experimented with a lot of mediums. I remember the first work I saw was this light box with, with colors moving around, but, um, you know, he has this need for, to play with, with geometric um, forms. And also, again, you see this form of movement. It informs you what this is, right? These are, are strips of, of, of wood, jacaranda, um, are strips that are put together. So again, very experimental going out into, you know, nature, into the, the organic, but um, making the organic uh, geometric. So it's a very interesting approach how he, he uses this to to right like uh, distort um, the organic into ge the geometric and and even though it's still you know um, you see the lines you see the the clean cut lines and how perfectly they are aligned with one another you know you you you're always bringing um, this work is always bringing back to the organic to the natural um, then I also wanted to within this gallery just really quickly um, go into Raul Morão, which is another artist that is, you know, oh, there's also Lija Papi here. Um, and let's look at her real quick, who's also part of this uh, uh, neo-concrete uh, movement with Elio Chisica from the 60s, uh, 70s. Um, and was also looking at that, right? Looking at um, geometric forms and, and moving into, into the body, moving, uh, using these forms and then slowly, um, you know, progressing into this more um, uh, experimental um, participatory approach as well. And how uh, Morão is, um, is uh, you know, much more uh, contemporary artist working today. Um, he is inspired by, you know, his urban surroundings, 
Um, and here you can see, you know, this bottle of, of, of wine, um, or it's a, you know, a glass bottle that is holding this, you know, geometric structure here. Um, you know, if you maybe go by it with the wind, it will slowly move. So again, this need for, for kinetic, for movement within these, um, what, you know, moving, moving the geometric form is, you know, you're adding movement and, and, uh, yeah, this, this, this almost performatic role into this very static, right? St static um, geometric shape. Um, and like I said, Haomoro is inspired by his surroundings, um, but you know, he always goes back to this uh, minimalist abstract sculptures, which, you know, we see here. But it's really interesting how he creates these you know, by putting these objects together, there's this interesting uh, just just the position. <laughs> um, this is also another one where you see this. You know, if you're looking from afar, you might um, consider this just being, you know, a painting that is, uh, you know, uh, a painting on canvas, and and it is. It's an oil on canvas, but it is a direct reference to those signs um, that you see on the street. I don't know if we have these here, but you see this a lot in Brazil when you're going down very curvy hills. Um, you know, these signs are on the side of the road informing you that, you know, a curve is coming up. Um, and it's usually black and yellow, but here he's playing with the colors. Then, um, let me go into the next. And again, look at, at while we're on, the, on Brazilian artists and looking at Brazilian art um, influenced by geometric abstraction, I want to point out Ruben Valentin, who was a um, artist from Salvador, Bahia. And um, he is, you know, unfortunately he started gaining a lot more um, uh you know, attention after his death. Um, but he worked a lot in the 70s, like late 70s, early 80s. His late 70s works are very um, iconic. And this is one example of that, where he um, paints. Uh, this is actually even more interesting because it's acrylic on wood. And, and I'll get that to that in a minute, but um, he creates these geometric abstraction works, but uh, influenced by Candomblé, which is an Afro-Brazilian religion. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, this brings you back to the anthropophagia um, thought, right? The anthropophagia um, concept that, that Osvaldo de Andrade and Tassila de Amaral, Mario de Andrade were, were discussing, were um, involved with in the early 20s, which was this movement um, in Brazil that these artists wrote a manifesto um, suggesting that, you know, where we go to Europe, we bring all of these influences back. And um, instead of, you know, just, repeating it or, you know, adding our, our, our tone to it. Let's eat it. You know, anthropophagy is almost this cannibalistic uh, thought. So let's eat it, you know, metaphorically. Um, let's digest it and let's, uh, you know, put something out that is Brazilian. Uh, you know, it's, it's in essence very Brazilian, but has absorbed, right, has absorbed these, these references, but into our own way, um, like we have digested it in, in our own way. So Ruben Valentin, and even at, when you look at Elio Chisica as well, Elio Chisica is also part of this uh, tropicalist movement, which um, this idea of the, the Anthropophagia Manifesto was at full force in the 60s and 70s with the trop uh, Tropicalia movement. Um, and Elio Chisica later on with his more, you know, participatory works was, you know, highlighting that and emphasizing that. And you see here Ruben Valenti, 
again, in the 70s, also, um, you know, at full force, bringing this thought that was created in the 20s um, back, uh, you know, 50 years later, recycling this idea of, of being influenced by, you know, um, cubism, geometric abstraction, and um, seeing, you know, seeing Brazil, seeing the culture of Brazil, maybe through that lens, or, or, you know, through that digested lens of, of, of these influences that were, you know, uh, coming from Europe. Um, so these are, you know, in many of his works, he paints these symbols that are, you know, uh, symbols that represent deities in, uh, in Candomblé and the Afro-Cuban religion. Um, he paints, uh, you know, he, he geometrifies them, geometrifies them. <laughs> um, and, and this is what we get. So he has a lot of paintings, but this is a great example of how he also explored with different materials. Um, here, uh, this is, let's look at the size. It's not, it's not a really big work. You know, he tends to work also very small, but has larger works as well. And we don't have any examples here, but this um, experimenting with wood also turns into sculptures. So he has created a lot of sculptures with, with um, these, you know, these um, geometric abstractions as well. So this is from Berenice Paula Arvani from Brazil, Sao Paulo. And then continuing, I think, you know, we have um, here in Miami, I'm not sure if we have a lot of people here in Miami, but um, we have uh, Piero Achugari, um, who has this, uh, you know, uh, is, Piero is the son of Pablo Achugari, and he has this beautiful gallery space if you haven't visited in um, here in Miami, I highly recommend it. It's very large with multiple spaces. Um, you know, he has, of course, some works very uh, by his iconic uh, father, uh, Pablo Chugari, which are, I believe, are, some of these are marble sculptures. And you see how, you know, beautifully um, this hard uh, work or metal or or acrylic or the various forms that, or, or materials that he uses are, you know, translated into these beautiful central sculptures. Then um, going back into this more, you know, geometric um, approach, we have Eugenio Espinosa, um, which reminds me a lot of what was going on, you know, in Brazil in the 70s, 60s uh, with this participatory art. However, Eugenio Espinosa has this um, approach to the grid, right? To the, um, to, to the actual grid and wanting to distort that. So here you see a square that is being pulled by, by a thread that is, you know, attached to this concrete rock or it's a rock that um, is, you know, almost pulling it. So again, you start seeing this, this movement um, added to this very static and rigid form. So um, this is one work from 1972. And then he starts experimenting with, you know, um, much earlier work, such as this one that he did in 2019, that was part of, a, of an exhibition at Piero Chugatti last year. Um, with a lot newer works, a mix of older works. Again, it's it's always amazing to see, you know, the early thought process of the artist and how it evolves into something different, yet it's still very informative of what they're working on now. So we have Eugenio Espinosa working on these newer works where he is using the frame, right? The frame of a painting and then, um, you know, uh, not distorting, but disassembling it and creating a new, a new object with it. Um, creating a sculptural form. So again, this this breaking of the grid, um, you know, the the 2D becoming 3D is very present in this newer work. 
And then let me just go back to the main page here. Again, this is another a great, let's just look at this again. Um, another great example of this, you know, breaking of the grid, um, literally, you know, taking it apart. Okay. And we have Arthur Lescher, who is a Brazilian artist that um, creates these beautiful, um, very sensual, you know, sculptures that um, have this, you know, just so asymmetric forms, um, geometric in a way, uh, very central, but symmetrical. And it's, it's just um, very interesting how he is able to use these you know, very rigid materials such as steel here and automotive paint um, and create these very seductive, sed you know, seductive um, sculptures that, that pull you in. I um, just wanna show you some details here. And look at the, you know, it's highly detailed. So from far away, you might just, you know, see these shapes and forms and, uh, very central pull you in, but as you get close to it, um, it just gives you, you know, a, additional details that one wouldn't see. And another, another work that, you know, by the fact that it's hung, um, it's hung from the ceiling, it also creates the sense of movement, you know, using lines and circular shapes, a very rigid geometric um, geometric shapes in order to create these central and uh, uh, asymmetrical works. And um, I really enjoyed, um, you know, looking through Pietro Echugati's gallery here because uh, it's very um, well curated, I would say, you know, with all of these geometric central forms like Arthur Lesher speaks greatly, you know, dialogues greatly with Pablo Chugaiti's work as well. Um, and then we continue to see uh, more geometrical, you know, working with the grid like in, in Marco Maggi. Maggi um, he is also a, a Brazilian artist. Here we have, you know, he's influenced by like these um, everyday materials that he collects and, 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 and creates and builds in the, into these, um, you know, geometric uh, form, compositions, geometric compositions, but also very uh, grid-like, right? And um, he's also interested in, in this idea of perception of time. So by collecting this, this, this very repetitive way of collecting materials and putting them, you know, into this new perspective um, is what he's interested in. And, you know, continuing with this um, abstraction, um, we have some works by Lijo Kumura here. Unfortunately, there's no installations, but these are just, um, you know, some drawings. Uh, acrylic and pencil on paper that informs her more sculptural practice. Um, uh, Piero Chugari had a, a show, um, I should say maybe summer of last year. <laughs> I'm not good with dates, but I believe that was approximately the time frame where um, there were a couple of these works by Lijo Kumura that were, you know, paint on steel. Um, on these uh, shapes, you know, geometric shapes on the floor, or on the wall, and painted on the wall, and just using this thread um, that connects, you know, the wall, the paint on the wall with the steel form on the floor, she creates this completely 3D uh, an optical illusion work that you look from it, you, you look at it from far away and you, you know, might think that this cube is at the corner of the gallery or right in the center. Um, but as you approach it, you start noticing how, you know, she 
fooled us in, in creating these optical illusions with, with just a single thread and these um, paint forms and shapes either on the wall or on the floor. Lidio Komoda is a Brazilian artist but has been working in New York for a long time. And uh, it's always great to see, you know, see these um, sketches and these drawings, you know, seeing the thought process and how when you see these works in real life and how, you know, how they come from paper to, to 3D. And we have other works here by Julio Pinto as well. Again, you start seeing this, like I said, it was very uh, highly well curated, I believe this, this gallery with, with the artists that are approaching uh, these geometric forms in various ways. Then, um, continuing with this idea, now looking at other, you know, younger artists, we have um, Proyecto Visible, um, a work by, or a couple of works by, by Castillo, Ilich Castillo. Um, and again, how, you know, it's interesting how many ways or artists have approached uh, geometric forms um, in, in various ways, right? We just saw Lijo Kumura who creates uh, optical illusions of 3D works. And, and, and then we have um, this artist here that is um, using these photographs that he collects, you know, he uses from, collects from NASA and is, you know, blacking out certain moments. So using images of, I, I wouldn't say of every day, but, you know, images that exist, real images and retransforming, recontextualizing it, um, uh, recontextualizing with these new forms, right? These in particular, I believe, are photo collages that he uh, recomposed using NASA images from the Mars exploration. So, and, and also like investigating, using these compositions, the blackouts, adding, adding some cutouts here and there. He's, you know, trying to match the, the or, or investigate, right? Examine and question all of the conspiracy theories that were involved with, with this expedition. So it's also a really interesting approach that I thought how, you know, artists are using these um, geometric forms into that. I think there's someone in the waiting room. Let me add that. And, <laughs> They have, you know, other uh, amazing artists, and I'll go brief here because we're almost running out of time, and I had so many artists um, uh, to share. But I'll go brief. Um, another Oscar Abraham Pabon, which we'll see in in another another gallery, where he is using you know, objects of every day and, and recontextualizing them through this approach of the geometric and adding that you know, to the forms and making the everyday a piece of art. And these are bricks, as you can see here, and by again, reimposing this, the, the rectangles of the bricks, he is, you know, re uh, contextualizing the brick as a new brick form. So it's really interesting play on, on this, you know, already like man-made material. Then um, Tony Vasquez Figueroa from Beatriz Gil Galeria. This is another work that I wanted to also talk about because, you know, Tony Vasquez is a Vanette. Oh, sorry. I keep doing that. Um, Tony Vasquez is a Venezuelan artist who is um, based here in Miami and he investigates, you know, like socioeconomic and political issues, but it's really interesting to look at these blackout, you know, works and, uh, you know, you might just look at it and think it's, um, uh, you know, just a, a painted and some another approach to to color, but but there's it's just so heavy, you know, um, conceptually. There's so many layers into this work, and this is called Black Mirror. But he also um, 
the works that are here, I'm actually, let me just go back. The works that are in this gallery are all 2D works, but he also works in um, installations. And the, the reason for using this black, you know, this black um, material and uh, just to let you know, it's, um, I don't know if you saw the medium line, but it's uh, bitumen, which is this liquid form of crude oil and plastics, you know, rubber, resin, like he also uses those, but these are uh, bitumen that he's using. And he's used in various um, works uh, to, you know, to talk about the oil, um, uh, industry in Venezuela and how it influences, you know, the country and all of these political um, and, and, and social ideologies that that surround surround this industry and and impact right impact his his country his home country. So um, it's also you know has this central um, approach too because uh, and this play. Um, you know, into into the work as well, where you just um, you know perceive this black um, this black color, and uh, as you approach it, you start seeing the the many you know textures that it creates. Or here we have bitumen on um, on plexi on a plexiglass box like the actual oil within that. And he has created a really interesting work that's not here where he has um, a little box of bitumen inside, very similar to this, I believe, um, very inside a acrylic box and it leaks very slowly because it's such a heavy um, material, it, it will leak you know, uh, after so many years, seven, 10 years or more, if I'm mistaken. Uh, and uh, it's also this very interesting approach to to the material. Is it ephemera art or, or not? You know, once the oil comes out of it and leaks, um, you know, what, what happens to it? But also very interesting uh, approach to, to the political situation within Venezuela, right? Like how, um, it, it can change or, 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 you know, throughout the years. Um, then let me just close, let me go back real quick. Mm. Oh, yes. Um, sorry, I thought I was going to talk about another artist, but um, here we have Gonzalo von Mayor, uh, who is also another Miami artist that, that um, you know plays with um, these social social um, issues and, and and culture popular culture too. So he questions of um, a lot in, in a lot of works, especially I mean this is a great example here because it's mixing the two. Um, he's questioning this, these notions of Caribbean identity and stereotypes within his work. And you see this as, you know, a representation in this work um, with these banana leaves coming out or, you know, surrounding this McDonald's um, uh, symbol, sign symbol. And, you know, he almost forces you to question like where, what, what place is he depicting? Because they're so real. Um, as you can notice here, these are charcoal on um, charcoal on paper, and uh, you know the level of detail is just so intricate and really pulls you in into the work. Um, let me just show you another example here. Oh, this is one of my favorites, where you know it's just so highly detailed and the mix of it, right? Like mixing this fancy luxurious um, chandelier with bananas that are, <laughs> are hanging, you know, something that, that is um, very representative of, you know, um, or it's, it's organic form, right? That, that disintegrates, but it's also, you know, um, um, uh, representative of, of Caribbean um, identity, which is something that he's very interested in, in, 
in talking about like all these symbols within his work, as, such as bananas. He also uses pineapples and pine tree, uh, palm trees, as I mentioned before. And this idea of national identity, right? Like with the McDonald's, a great example of, of, of these hybrid, right? Hybrid identities. It's another one. Smaller look, I believe, yeah. So to show the level of, of intricacy with charcoal, right? Um, when you think about charcoal, you usually think of this very, you know, um, uh, rigid material that is, um, you know, harsh. I mean, not harsh, it's very raw um, and has this very strong, um, you know, effect, but Fuen Mayor is is very um, you know confident with this with this medium and creates these very detailed um, detailed works that are just amazing to see them in person. I'm just remembering that I haven't seen one in the last in a long time. Oh no, actually did. Then what else? Um, also from. From Galeria Fernando Pradilla, which is this gallery. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, I'll go up here real quick. Um, a gallery from Spain, but when my word is is based in Miami. That's why I wanted to highlight him a little bit. It's a it's an artist that we are always interested in, in looking at. Um, then we have Nadine Ospina, who same way that Fuen Mayor is, is looking at these, you know, um, cultural icons um, such as banana or a McDonald um, sign, the symbol of, you know, uh, this capital, capitalist world. Here we have Nadine Ospina, who's creating these, um, these sculptures or these totems that, you know, from far away, you might uh, think that it's, uh, you know, historical or pre-Columbian sculpture. Um, and it's in stone, as you can see here, it's made in stone. Um, but, you know, of course, when you get a little bit closer to it, you start seeing um, these uh, um, iconic figures of, of, our popular culture, right? We have Mickey Mouse. He also has played a little bit with um, images of, of the Simpsons. We actually have one work in our collection that has a Bart Simpson done in this um, in this stone that looks like a pre, you know, a pre-Columbian work. Uh, yet it's very, <laughs> very um, recent. Another, and I love the titles too, like Idol or School. You know, this is, he's saying that we're putting, you know, these popular cultures almost in a pedestal, but really in a way to not, not criticize, but examine how we perceive these, um, these symbols within our society, right? And what role uh, do they play? And again, another, um, work by a couple of works by Oscar Abraham Pabon, where he is, um, again, using these uh, everyday objects. Uh, we saw previous works of bricks and we see two examples here, but then um, let me pull this up. Just for us to look at the details of this work where you see, you know, the remnants of this rug um, of how this object, you know, used to be the outside of it. And he carves into it, creating, you know, um, recontextualizing, creating new shapes, newer shapes with the rug. So it's a one piece, but, uh, you know, from far away, you might think that it's uh, a collage. Um, but once you start analyzing this uh, larger work, I'd say sculptural. Yeah, definitely sculptural piece, how it transforms into something else. Um, and I think we're running out of time. So I'll just do one more. Um, let, me just, uh, no, let me just go back to the last one where um, Multiple Espaço Arte, it's um, a space where they, you know, uh, 
are interested in cultivating art, but also like through additions. So you see a lot of um, addition works here um, in the space. That's the whole idea. And that's, I kind of wanted to end with that because in, in many art fairs, we're always, uh, you know, looking at the new, the new thing or, or um, a, a piece that, you know, um, uh, a newer work or historic work, as I mentioned earlier with uh, the Francisco Toledo uh, examples that I gave um, or very iconic works like Hula the Park, El Chisica. But then um, I really um, thought it was amazing to see this gallery here because they offer, you know, are at a more affordable price. So we have a couple of of editions here by Antonio Gias, who's a really iconic Brazilian artist that recently passed away. Um, very uh, mythical work. And um, let me just go back to, I really wanted to highlight a couple of other works such as Carlos Cruz Diaz, who is also an iconic uh, Venezuelan artist, um, again, going back to Soto and La Park and, and many others, other artists that I mentioned, you know, this approach to geometric um, and kinetic art by creating kinetic art um, with, you know, these geometric forms. And lastly, uh, Ciudad Meireles, which is a Brazilian artist, one of my uh, artist that I'm always interested in seeing, but he had created these interventions. Um, and this is uh, uh, a record of this iconic figure, I mean, iconic uh, installation and performance that he did by, by collecting all of these uh, match boxes and putting in the space. So he was offering, you know, this very, um, dangerous, dangerous space and inviting the viewers into the space. So this is uh, a, a, a record, a record of that, of that uh, performance that he did um, inside this, you know, huge, <laughs> larger, larger than, than, than real size matchbox with, with the matches. And um, I was actually talking to an artist uh, a couple of weeks ago about this, you know, this, Matchbox is such an iconic figure, you know, a figure of every day within Brazil, Fiat Lux. Um, so it's 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 nice to see this reference. So there's a little video here that I won't play, but I just wanted to end with that, you know, um, uh, with Binta, um, and and you know, it's it's very interesting to or important, I feel like, to explore, you know, the varieties of, of artwork that you're able to get, you know, from multiples, from additions to um, older historical pieces. So I'll end here with that on that note. So I hope you enjoy uh, and explore um, the fair online. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Bueno, Jennifer. Eh, te quiero agradecer muy especialmente, realmente estuvo increíble la mirada tuya sobre la feria, muy interesante, y a toda nuestra audiencia, eh, esta es ya nuestra última visita guiada, quiero que sepan que todas las charlas eh, se editan y van a estar en nuestro canal de YouTube en pinta.art, donde van a poder ver las visitas guiadas, volver a ver a Jennifer, y las conversaciones con los coleccionistas. Y les, les, los invito todo este fin de semana a seguir visitando la página, a seguir visitando las ferias, recorriendo las galerías, para hacer ya las últimas compras, para cerrar la edición que se va a cerrar el próximo martes 15 de diciembre. Y esperando ya que el año que viene volvamos a la normalidad, volvamos a las ferias físicas, y creo que esto va a ser un complemento a la parte virtual, donde vamos a estar ya con una feria física y acompañada de una feria virtual. Eh, Jennifer, muchísimas gracias y nos vemos en el PAM. Gracias a todos.